Hi to everyone. Welcome. Nex here. I'm like buzzing. I've also had two coffees, um, <laughs> which I probably shouldn't have, but we are jumping on today um, for a really, really exciting video. Um, look, I know that my page is very much about watch your language, but watching our language is very much a whole part of our being. It's not just the words we speak to ourselves, it's how we look after our body. And it's how we look after our heart space as well. And for me, starting to understand and learn about how important our feet are to the rest of the structure of our body, so our knees, our hips, our spine, but also right now our connection to nature is so, so, so important. Hey there, Trina. Thank you so much for jumping on. If we are literally and constantly covering our feet in, in shoes or we are not paying attention to how we move from the ground up, then we're really, really going to struggle with this sense of connection. And right now, when we don't have that sense of connection, um, we can feel overwhelmed, we can feel ungrounded, um, and it really, really does start with our feet. So you might have noticed that I've been sharing a lot about feet. I just recently did a workshop myself um, at at Redhead Wellness Century. Um, so yeah, so if you are interested in the the workshop, then get in touch with me as well for this week. You can grab it for ten dollars less than what it usually is. It is all uh, recorded and ready to go. Um, and I've just got to send it through for your email. Plus, you've got about six or seven different movements that you're going to do to practice in your own time to help strengthen your feet. Cool. So I'm just um, bringing on or just waiting to bring on James from the Foot Collective Australia. So super, super excited to... Oh, morning. Hi. How you going? Oh, wow. Good to see you, James. Thank you so much for jumping on. Pleasure. Excited to be here. Yeah, no, I, um, as I was saying before, as I was talking through, there's always this like one to two minute bit of like getting it all sorted and, yeah. you know, getting people online as a double. Um, it is what it is at the moment. But, um, no, super excited that you're here and, Yes, yeah, so, so great. I'm super excited too, just um, to share this stuff. I love uh, myself personally. I know you're the same. Just seeing people move better and have better functioning feet, hips, spines, knees, all of that stuff. 100%. Um, yeah. So, so James is the, the founder of TFC Australia yeah. and you're a physiotherapist. Is that right as well? Yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, yeah. I've been, been practising, well, I had been practicing for the last five years or so, but um, since COVID hit, actually, it, I haven't been practicing as a physio, but just doing the full collective stuff with the workshops and seminars and everything. Yeah, yeah totally, totally. Um, it's yeah, and what, what's the sort of the passion and the drive behind that, James? Like, yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to know. Yeah, I, it, it is really just that that I, I myself, I suppose, feel so much benefit and joy from getting moving and especially like play-based type movement and I guess I've, I've seen a lot of people with very sort of persistent pain issues and dysfunction and a whole heap of different things in my experience which has mostly been sort of musculoskeletal private practice but also some work in aged care with sort of I guess like the worst of the worst when it comes to feet balance and pain and um, and just sort of movement dysfunction in general. And that really sort of drives that passion for helping people prevent that kind of stuff and to solve that stuff as well, which a lot of it is sort of curable or solvable if you have the right approach to health and movement. Yeah, definitely. It's something actually I hear a lot of all the time. I'm too old to do anything about my feet or um you know it's been like that for so long and and you know it's everything's changing you know our cells are changing until we die and you know i'm guessing you've probably seen a lot of that as well and i think that's a really important thing for people to know whatever we have done over the years uh, however long um we've spent you know doing what we're doing with our feet it can definitely change right 
Absolutely, yeah. It, the the body is always adaptable, and as you get older, like the longer you've had doing a certain thing, the longer it takes to sort of reverse it, I suppose. Um, so younger people have an easier time changing their body, but it's always it's always possible. And I think the biggest thing is just having the belief. Like that's probably one of the biggest things that I work with as a physio is actually changing people's belief around their pain and their body and they've been taught a lot of things by doctors or certain practitioners that you know their diagnosis is forever and they just have to manage it um whereas uh the latest research coming out is that if you believe you can change that's probably one of the biggest indicators or the biggest um signs that you will actually uh get better oh i'm um yeah i'm i'm the same i'm such a huge believer in that you know i took um just written a book on on our language and the words we speak to ourselves, and mm. it, it really is a belief in no matter whether it's mentally, emotionally, or physically. It is the belief that things can change, and if that's exactly it, if we say that we are stuck here, if we are, you know, in that mindset of like, oh, it's been this way forever, then it's, it's so true. Nothing will change. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you have books with neuroplasticity, anything is possible. And I think you just nailed it on the head there with the word belief. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's a, yeah, there's a great book. Uh, one of my favorites is Biology of Belief by Bruce Lipton. And that sort of changed the game in terms of my understanding of how that that all works in terms of like your beliefs literally do change your biology and your physiology. And, and that I think is the keystone to making any change in your life for sure. Mm, I agree. Bruce Lipton is such an amazing teacher, isn't he? Oh, yeah. Yeah, some really great stuff on YouTube too. Um, but it does. It just gives us that. Like, oh, look, I wonder, I wonder what I can do rather than what I cannot. And it just flips the script completely. Yeah. But um, no, it's, look, I, I really wanted to, to get James on here. As a little bit, you know, I did a, um, a foot health immersion myself last week. Um, I'm so passionate. I see so many people, I guess, in the industry that I'm in, in movement and in yoga that really struggle um, with plantar fasciitis, that struggle with collapsed arches, that struggle with... Um, medially rotated knees from the collapsed arches in their feet um, and then of course the culture of sitting and wearing shoes mm. um, I wanted to just expand on that a little bit just from your point of view I know you guys speak on that so much and um, I know when I did the course the uh, workshop 1.0 with you guys as well you speak on sitting and shoes a little bit what's your thoughts on all that yeah, I mean, with you're right. I think those two are, are big sort of linchpins in terms of people's musculoskeletal health because I think the biggest reason is it just saps or it sort of it puts people in an environment where they're lacking movement nutrition. So that's probably one of my other favorite books is um, Katie Bowman's Move Your DNA. And the she uses the analogy of movement being like nutrition for our bodies and just like food yeah. and we need the right... Uh, quantity, quality, and variety of nutrients. And so a lot of people, in, because they put their feet in shoes that uh, don't allow the natural movement of the foot, then their feet become very sedentary and they just don't get uh, anywhere near as much quantity, quality, or variety of movement in their feet. And then obviously the chair, which a lot of people don't think of chairs as technology, but they are a technology. They're an invention that we created to make things more comfortable, to make sitting more comfortable. And that sort of culture of comfort of people always wanting to be comfortable and sitting down is actually also creating the, the lack of movement nutrients as well in their, in their diet, so in their movement diet. Um, mm. So it's, I think that's a really key thing and, and a big part of what we're trying to solve with uh, our approach to feet and sort of ground living and just getting people away from these technologies that our body doesn't actually need. Like they feel comfortable in the short term, but our bodies don't need them for one. Uh, and they also are actually quite terrible for our bodies in the long term. Yeah. Oh, definitely. It's, um, it's really interesting. I only started, I guess, myself. Um, my own movement journey through um, the Movement Collective um, and obviously Infused Health um, and then Soichi down at uh, Praxis in Canberra, um, you know, starting to just implement, I guess, you know, methods from Ido Portal and actually come back to this, this 
simplicity um, mm -hmm. of less, less equipment. You know, I know Ido Patal says something along the lines of the more equipment, the less the mover. And we can get so uh, caught up in thinking we need everything to help us move better when it really comes back down to like just here and working from the ground up, I believe. Yeah, yeah, 100%. The, the body, your body is all the technology or has all the technology that it needs. Yes. And yes. if you learn how to sort of use your body in, in lots of different ways, then you realize that you really don't need much equipment. Another, I think it was a quote from Ido is that high tech shoes equals low tech feet. Because if your yes. high tech yes. shoes are doing all the work, then your feet don't have the time or the, the space to build up their own technology, which is sort of much better than a shoe. Yeah. You know, it's, you mentioned actually, and there's some messaging when we're going back and forth, you know, you got out in the bush on the weekend and whatnot and, you know, I'm sort of the same. And it's just to get out there barefoot and let your foot be a foot and go over the rocks and the, the sticks and stuff like that as well. Like it's just, you know, I remember a couple of weeks ago I was actually walking down to Dudley and somebody was like, oh, my God, you're walking in bare feet. Like, and I was like, yeah, like that's what the foot's meant to do, but it's almost – considered, oh, my God, your foot is going to hurt or whatever, but it just reminds you that that's what the foot is designed to do, to be a foot, not to be cushioned and protected and kind of put in a cast consistently. Yeah, yeah well, exactly. And I think that is a, a big thing that people have been, uh, I guess, sold this idea that their feet do need that technology. And I, and I, I really do think that in certain cases, feet do need protection um, and they need the right amount of protection for the right context. So if you're walking on something that's like super hot, like Australia, here in Australia, we get extremely hot days and, you know, it can, can really burn. And so maybe yeah. you do want a layer of protection between your feet and the ground because otherwise you're going you're gonna to really hurt your feet. And um, I had an experience where I was wearing really thin soled shoes, which is usually great. Um, but I was out bush and I was carrying a really heavy log and then just stepped on a, it was either a sharp stick or a thorn and that just went straight through the sole of my shoe and into my foot. And I ended up, I did actually end up with like a chunk of stick in my foot for about yeah. six weeks, which I didn't realize. Um, but in that sense, uh, some thicker shoes would have been a better option for that context that I was working in. Um, Definitely. Whereas for the most part, <laughs> most people don't need that level of protection, especially if you give your feet the time to adapt to the, the extra load, because, you know, a lot of people would see me walking barefoot, um, yeah, in nature or even on like gravel or something like that. And they'd be like, oh, geez, doesn't that hurt your feet? Because it would hurt their feet. But my feet actually love the feeling of going on that kind of texture because I've allowed them the, the time and space to develop that. And they actually crave it now. And it feels weird if I don't get that texture. Oh, no, I'm, I'm the same and it, it really is. And I think just on that note as well, I think right now at the, the times we're living in, it can feel very ungrounded. We can be quite disconnected because there's no structure. Everything's changing day by day. And, you know, in yogic terms, they, you know, our feet are linked in with our root chakra, which is, a, which is our link to a sense of grounding and security and safety um, and feeling like that things are safe. And if we're... We, if we're constantly, again, if we're not able to get out of nature or just put our feet in the grass or the ocean, um, you know, we can lose that connection and, and it can sort of, you know, play an effect on our minds as well. And mm. as what you said, there is that, that desire, that craving to get outside and put your feet on the ground. And, you know, on a more metaphysical level, it does help the mind settle as well. Um, it's definitely something I do often, especially at the moment. Yeah. And I think a lot of people can resonate. They go, oh, yeah, it does. Of course, it feels nice to get my bare feet on sand when I'm at the beach or on grass. You know, it's like it's a good feeling, but they don't realize that that can then extend to sticks and bark and gravel and whatever, um, because over time your feet go, oh, this, this is good. Like that, again, that, that texture is kind of like a nutrient for the feet as well. Like a lot of people refer to it as vitamin T. I think it might have been Katie Berman originally, but vitamin T, yeah, vitamin yeah. T, yeah. and they really do thrive on that that input and that sensory input, and they shouldn't be so sensitive to you know little bits of texture in the environment. They should actually enjoy that feeling. Yeah, it's um, uh, I know in the first workshop, the the guys um 
from the Foot Collective have actually just really men- mentioned that our feet are sensors and exactly yeah. that. And it's, yeah, and, and you guys are the same and just this the, this ability to go, oh, what is this this texture? What is, what is it that I'm working on? How do I need to adjust the rest of my body, et cetera? Um, yeah, but it, yeah. it's just yeah, it's one of those things. I think it's, um, you know, just coming back to that, I guess what would you suggest? It's, it's easy enough to say, but I spent a lot of time working in Alicia Health Retreat over the last 10 months and I saw a lot of people day in, day out, I guess from the age of 30 to, to 60 that have worn shoes all their life and, you know, we talk a little on the feet and they're keen ads to get out of their shoes, um, but there's got to be a transition period, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. yeah, because, I mean, uh, the analogy between shoes and couches is is good because if you put your foot in a really cushioned, supportive, arch-controlled piece of footwear, then it's mm. almost the equivalent of putting your feet on the couch um, where they're not having to do much work, they're comfortable, um, they're not getting much sort of sensory or physical stimulation. And then people kind of intuitively know that if you've spent 10 years on the couch, then you're not going to get up straight up and go for a 10 kilometer run or lift a hundred kilos at the gym or, you know, do a really intense workout and your body will just be fine. They're kind of like, Oh yeah, I need to build up slowly. And, and we just need to take that same approach to the feet. So a lot of people have had their feet have been on the couch for 50, 60 years because it's the norm for, for people to wear cushioned supportive footwear because that's what has been sold to everyone by the footwear industry um yeah and if you sort of give i like giving those kind of analogies where it's pretty obvious what the what the answer is and then people go oh, okay so i just apply the same thing to my feet and it's, and i it's a similar concept is you know if you hurt your back you probably wouldn't want to wear a back brace for the rest of your life. You may need to, like, depending on how bad the injury is, you may need to sort of, um, you know, have some relative rest where you're not doing as much with it while it heals. But you want to then be working on strength and mobility for your spine so that it actually can support itself in the long run, as opposed to going, oh, now we just have to wrap you with a back brace and we never move you back again. And mm. that analogy is good for people because they go, oh, yeah, why would I do that to my feet? If I wouldn't do it to my back, why would I do it to my feet with, with orthotics? Um, which is ex- pretty much exactly what happens and what people are uh, told to do. And I think that's really, a, I guess, a, a symptom or an example of what our whole healthcare system has become about is sort of passive, um, passive modalities that just people can either take a pill or put an orthotic in or have a surgery or something like that, which yeah. sort of takes the onus off them and and they're then relying on some kind of external thing being done to them to help them feel better. But a lot of people sort of get frustrated with that because a lot of times the pain comes back either in the same spot or in a different spot and they're just sort of chasing these pains with all of these different modalities and, and they're never actually learning how to take care of their own body, which is, I guess, yeah, which is what we're all about is empowering people with those, those, that knowledge and those skills to, to take care of their own body. Oh, so true. It's almost like a Band-Aid solution, isn't it? There's, yeah. um, you know, it really is, and no matter what it is as well. And it's, it's like even in the environment we're in at the moment, it's easy to numb and run from things and provide this, this layer above what's going on instead of actually looking at the underlying. And I think that's the thing. It's the understanding and the knowledge. You go, hang on a second, I really can do something about this. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with orthotics, but it's just also doing the work to go, hang on a second, how can I strengthen this so I don't have to wear them for the rest of my life? Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah and, just, you know, definitely it, not bagging orthotics. It's, um, no. they, have their, they have their time and place, but it's all about having an exit plan. There's only a very tiny percentage of people that need to have orthotics long term. And that's more for like genetic or traumatic conditions that, um, you know, can't, I guess, can't be necessarily changed by active work. Um, There's always ways to improve function, even in those cases. But um, for the most part, if you've been prescribed orthotics, uh, and they help you get through your day, and they help modify or manage your symptoms, that's great. But yeah, having having an exit plan is, is Oh, absolutely. And that also means we're always growing as well, always learning more and more about the body. And, and I think, you know, I, 
I know myself, I was so stuck not so long ago. I just wasn't in a space to learn about my body. I thought I was stuck with my back pain. I thought I was stuck with my shitty feet. You know, I was starting to develop bunions. My arches had nearly collapsed because I wore heels in radio, obviously, and right. constantly yeah. in Nike and ASICs, like I was a runner. And my feet were terrible, you know, but I didn't know there was another option. Yeah. Um, nobody, nobody talked about feet. Like, and I think that's why I've been, you know, so attracted to what you guys do. Um, and, of course, through movement, just go, oh, my God, this is a whole next level. And it's helped my glutes. It's helped my back pain. Um, my hips are much more mobile. And, um, you know, again, I, I want to actually just really talk about what you talk about in your workshop, which is feet balance and play. Yeah. And they're three things that I never incorporated not so long ago. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, it can be life-changing. Like, they're so simple. I think that's what I love about it. It's so simple, I suppose. It doesn't have to be very complex to work on your feet balance and just get playing with movement. But it really can yeah. make all, all the difference to your relationship with your own body and with, with movement so and much. your environment. And it's, um, yeah, it can be, it's very profound. Very simple, but very profound. Yeah, and it's super addictive. Like, yeah. it's... Um, yeah. Oh hey, money! Um, money munch just jumped on. But yeah, and that's the ah. thing. It's it, it's um it's an addiction that makes you again feel like a child again. You reconnect back with yourself, and um, I know that um, we've kind of set up our rooms to do some practical stuff. So yeah. I want to leave it up to you now to share. I've actually got my dad. I love him. He made a balance thing. <laughs> um, yeah. But I know you guys sell them on your website as well. So as a gal, put the links down below. But this is honestly one of the best things that I have ever had. I use it constantly. Um, so yeah, let's um, let's share some practical stuff. Sweet. Yeah, sounds good. Well, um, I mean, I, I usually, like we've already touched on it before, but when it comes to feet, I usually like to just reiterate that the, there's two sort of primary functions of the feet. And first is for movement. So there's 26 bones, 33 joints, and four layers of muscle in each foot. So that there's a reason for all that hardware to exist, and that is for movement. Um, and they are our foundation for movement because we're bipedal animals. We spend most of our time on our feet. Um, mm. And then the other primary function is what we talked about for, before is sensation. So they're, they're actually very, very important sensors. And there's like up to 200,000 nerve endings in each foot, and they've got Wow. Uh, like a lot of sensitivity, kind of similar to our hands and our tongue and everything that they're sort of overrepresented in the brain when it comes to sensation. And that's because we need to use them to feel what's going on in the ground. And then that sends signals to our brain that then allows us to have a, an intelligent sort of output, an intelligent movement output to react to what's going on in the ground. So we want to obviously protect feet, but not at the expense of their main functions. And that's, I, I always like to just show people, because before we get into practical stuff, it's important that people know that the environment that their foot spends the most amount of time in is the most important thing for their foot health. So um, I actually just got these shoes yesterday. I started, me and my business partner, Mac, um, yeah. have started playing soccer, uh, like a sort yeah. of casual soccer. And you kind of do need a soccer boot for... Soccer. Uh, I have yeah. tried playing in a Vivo, um, and they just don't don't work that well because you slip and slide. Okay, and can imagine. <laughs> yeah. So these ones didn't feel great on my feet at all. But I was only playing for an hour and a half, and then totally. I took them off, and I sort of put some toe spreaders in, and I can roll out my feet today. And it's um, it's a lot of people get caught up in like, well, I have to wear this shoe for this or I have to wear this shoe for that. But as long as you're spending the most amount of your time in something that is wide, like so wide toe box mm -hmm. allows your, like your full toe splay. And also the biggest thing there is a straight first ray because yeah. if you can see in this shoe, it kind of points inwards and that points your big toe inwards. And that big toe alignment, um, which I can show you when I get up, <clears throat> That big toe alignment is really important for arch function and just sort of overall walking and running mechanics and everything. So, um, spending it's like if we put our something. hand in a shoe, right? Like if yeah. we put our hand in this yeah. enclosed shoe, we're going to really struggle to to yeah. to do this to move them the way they should. Exactly. Like imagine trying to get through your day typing or like, <laughs> grabbing it or, or whatever. Um, 
So yeah, we, we kind of want to think about shoes as a, allowing the foot to function as close to barefoot as possible. So wide is a big one for that. Thin, um, so WTFF is a new mnemonic, which is kind of easy to remember. Wide, thin, so that it actually allows a lot of that sensation to come up from the ground. Um, yeah. Flat, so there's no, a lot of modern shoes have this sort of heel lift to some degree, um, where the heel is up like that. And that just poses risk to your ankle mobility and calf strength and, and a whole heap of different things. And it also puts unnatural loads on your, um, on your toes as well. So wide, thin, flat. And then the last one we like to look at is flexible. So being able yeah. to move your shoes around like that, even to roll them up. Yeah. Um, that's really important because those 33 joints in the foot are, are supposed to move that if they don't, if they get put in a cast, like you said, um, where it's rigid and cushioned and they're not allowed to move, then those joints get stiff and they lose their function. And that means that you're not actually able to adapt to the ground properly. So the environment that your foot spends the most amount of time in is the most important thing. So like we said, it, it's important to transition to shoes like this. This is a Vivo barefoot, but there's a heap mm -hmm. of different barefoot shoe brands. The main thing is that you're looking for wide, thin, flat, flexible. Um, mm -hmm. Then, like we said, most people have spent a lot of time, many, many years in conventional footwear, which are rigid, narrow, cushioned, supportive. And so they've actually over time lost a lot of the function of their feet. And so yeah. that's where we sort of talk about foot restoration because we need to restore the sort of natural function of the foot and reverse the negative effects of the modern footwear. Um, so it, time wise, we won't be able to go through everything, but like, like we've talked about, I've got that online workshop that goes into more detail, but there's a few, few things that I'll show. I'm just trying to figure out how to frame this video. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll start with one one of my favorite sets uh called the human toe spreader so we we sell yeah. what called wild toes which are like just toe spreaders that you can put in um, but if you don't have that and even if you do have the wild toes then this is a really good one to start restoring the alignment and the mobility in the toes and the midfoot as well so it just basically you're interlacing your fingers through your toes as far as you can. You might only be able to get to say the tips of your fingers or you can try and go all the way in. And then from here, for a lot of people, that itself just feels really intense. Like, whoa, my, fit, like my toes shouldn't be moving like that. But this, you'll, you'll adapt to this pretty quickly. And then mm -hmm. that splay is a really, good indicator of your toe function. So if you can get that splay yeah. going, that's great. Um, and then you can sort of rotate your feet around like that with your hands. And this starts to restore some of the midfoot mobility. So all these joints in your midfoot, um, all the tarsals <clears throat> and the metatarso, like well, MTP joints um, between the tarsals and your um, phalanges and between the tarsals and the metatarsals, um, basically all the joints in your foot can start getting some extra mobility like this. So that she one, feels really good, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. Yeah. At first it's like, geez, this is intense. But then over time, <laughs> even in like one session like this, you'll be like, oh, it's actually kind of starting to feel nice. Um, yeah. So yeah, stick through it. Like I said, often you might not be able to get all the way through with your fingers. Some people do just have really thick fingers or really tiny feet. Um, yeah. So that makes, that makes this a little harder, but that's, <laughs> that's where the toe spreaders can also come in handy. So totally. sort of pushing back, pushing forward, and then side to side. Might as well change feet to even it out. And when, when you do change feet, just have a go at sort of actively splaying your toes open and closed like that. And usually you'll feel a difference before and after doing the spreader. So we'll, we'll go to the other side. Do you know what, James? It must have been about two years ago that um, we had a movement retreat with uh, Craig Mallett, um, the guys from Infuse Health. Soichi came down as well. 
from Praxis and we did this. And <laughs> I remember I really struggled with it. And as I said, like, as you said, things are things always change. But, um, yeah, just it's been spending a lot more time on my own feet in those last two years. But I remember the first time I did this and it was super awkward. So, yeah, it feels much different doing it now. Yeah, yeah. It's um, I was the same. When I first did it, I was like, oh, this is too intense. And <laughs> I really do it at our workshops as well. And a lot of people like, just making faces and and just it, it's clearly uncomfortable but um but it it does it does adapt quite quickly and then ends up feeling really good so it's, it's a great thing to do when you're like because you get some ground sitting time as well if you're just watching netflix or just chilling on the ground then it's a great thing to just yeah. get up and give your feet some love and it's also something that i think a lot of people have a bit of a thing about touching their feet um yeah. and you know, like, oh, I don't touch my feet and, you know, feet are gross or whatever. But it, it's, it's, a, it's about building that relationship with your feet and getting comfortable and, and um, really loving your feet. And, and yeah, like we, we say, give, the, give your feet the love they deserve because um, yeah. they're, they're holding you up all day. So you might as well give them some love and attention. Yeah. And I love that too because it's, it's just a part of us and none of, do you know what I mean, every single yeah. part of us deserve love. Like it's, yeah. and that's what you guys say in your course, the only reason that they, they smell is because we put them in shoes all day and they get ugly is because we squish them up. So, yeah, yeah I yeah. love that. So if we go barefoot more, then we don't get as smelly. Or, well, bare feet just don't smell. It's only the shoes that make no. them smell. Um, yeah. And they don't get as sort of, Mangled, I suppose. Uh, mangled's not a good yeah. word, but <laughs> they don't get as affected by the tight shoes. Um, so yeah. They look better. Yeah. yeah. So the next next one we can work on is another one of my favorites, which is I, I just call it toe piano. Um, so I'm going to stand up. I think I'll probably lose my. Oh yeah. Well, hopefully everyone can see, but I'll explain it as well. So what we're doing at, to start with is just lifting all of our toes off the ground as high as we can and then placing them back down and then a, 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 a good place to start is just lifting the big toes up and leaving your little toes down and then changing so big toes down little toes up so this is a bit of a brain teaser for a lot of people they like <laughs> what is going on um, yeah and it is it is quite challenging at first but as you build up your mobility that that helps and also it's just a, a measure of how well your brain is connected to your feet and how much how much control over your feet your brain actually has. <clears throat> so up like that. Yeah. And and then the progression to that is what I like I said, what I call toe piano, which is where you are lifting maybe I'll try and angle this a little bit. Yeah, I was just on the same thing. I'm like, how do we get this camera to work? <laughs> yeah. So that should be better. So lifting all your toes up like this, and then you want to try and splay your pinky toes out as far as you can and put those down first, and then try to lower each toe individually onto the ground, kind of like you're playing a, a weird tune on the piano. <laughs> it, wouldn't, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't actually sound like hey, that. That's the thing, you never know. It's 2021, anything could happen. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then you want to try and reverse it. So lifting the big toes up and then each toe individually off the ground until you get to your pinky toes. So this is like your maximum active splay. Like how far can you actually splay your toes if you're trying to do it yourself with your own muscles? So it's, it's a really good thing to do straight after wearing toe spreaders or straight after doing that human toe spreader. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people, when they start trying to do this, they'll feel a whole heap of stuff going on in their feet in terms of activation. So their, their feet are starting to work in ways that they haven't worked before. And they can even feel a little crampy at first, but yeah. again, with practice, then that just gets better and better. And it starts to feel like just a really good, a nice workout for the feet. I know when we do this at Infuse Health, um, a lot of us get like T-Rex hands, like there's this yeah. like tension, <laughs> tension that happens in the face, tension that happens, you know, in the in the hands and whatnot. Um, the concentration is huge. Yeah, um, sure. but, yeah, such such a good one. Um, yeah. 
but yeah, it's it's you notice also, or I do anyway, especially um, sometimes the difference with the left and the right foot, of course, as well. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, a lot of people are like, oh, I can do it on my right, but not on my left. But it generally just takes the practice and mobilizing the feet and toes will help get that back as well. Mm -hmm. um, so the last thing that I would like to go through with feet is uh, just about arch control. So a lot of people have been told that they have flat feet and that that means they have to have arch controlled right. footwear or orthotics or things like that to support their arch. But the yeah. arch, for the vast majority of people, the arch should be able to support itself with muscular control. And Can I just ask a question on that, James, just quickly? Yeah. If somebody has got flat feet, right, and I, I've heard it often, is there the possibility, of course, that they can then start to strengthen that arch? Oh, yeah. And yeah. rebuild it. Yeah. There is, yeah. 100%. Yeah. It's something I hear often so, so much. I've got flat feet. I can't do anything about it. But in my eyes, in my opinion, 100% we can. So. And also, I would add to that as well that everyone has a different arch height. Like, um, totally. It's not the be all and end all of foot function. Like a lot of people are like, oh, I've got flat feet, so my feet are terrible. But there's a lot of people that can be very functional with a flatter arch. Uh, and there's mm -hmm. a lot of people with a really high arch that also have foot problems. So it's not, it's not like a one-to-one -one relationship. Yeah. Or even a lot of people with just sort of like a normal arch will have foot problems as well. So it's, yeah. it's, um, it's not like a death sentence for your feet to, to be diagnosed with flat feet. But at the same time, most people can improve that through their relation, like the relationship between their feet and their hips. So we'll just yeah. go through a, a, a simple drill now for that. So one thing I'll just touch on quickly is that your, your feet can sort of act like a tripod. So three points of the tripod, are your heel, the ball of your foot, and the pinky toe ball, like the ball of your pinky toe. Yeah. With a tripod, if you kick one of the legs out, then it doesn't remain very stable. So that's why that big toe alignment where it's pointing straight rather than kicked in is really, really important. Because if your big toe is kicked in, then your arch automatically suffers and you don't have as much yeah. of this control. So for just for everyone if anyone's following along at home just try and get your big toes as straight as possible and get as much active splay as you can and then you can just try and rotate your knees inwards and outwards so it looks like your knees are rotating but really it's mostly happening in your hips and yes, yeah as you go as you push your knees towards each other and away from each other just look at what's happening at your feet at your arch so the knees, as the knees come in, then the foot pronates and the arch flattens. And as your yep. knees come out, then your foot supinates and your arch lifts. And so yep. that will happen to different degrees for different people. But what the key thing there is that your hip rotation really affects the position of your arch. And so yeah. the way we think about it is that the the hips set the position of the arch and then the feet or the, the intrinsic muscles of the feet hold that in place. So um, what you can do is gently push your knees out, not to the point that you're lifting your foot up at all. So the foot stays in full contact with the ground, but push the knees out. And then you can sort of grip the ground with your feet as if you're trying to Often it's called short foot where you're trying to actually like shorten your feet like that. Yeah. It's probably pretty subtle in the video, but you should feel these arch muscles lift. Yeah, you can feel it. Yeah. Yeah. Another way to, another way to do that is to lift all of your toes up like that and that will immediately lift your arch up. Yeah. Then just try and maintain that position of the arch and slowly lower it down. And you should yeah, feel it. Yeah, it's so subtle that you feel it, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it, it can take a bit of practice, but for most people, they'll really start to feel the, the muscles in their arch. And then from there, you can challenge that by shifting your weight. So if, if I wanted to challenge that position of the arch, I could shift my weight over to one side and then even lift one leg and try to maintain all of that alignment between my feet, my knee and my hip. So I 
if yeah. I'm doing a lot of this, then I don't have very good structural stability there. Um, yeah. But if I'm able to just maintain this alignment as is with one leg up, then that, that alignment maintains. Now, I, just, I always like to qualify that it's not that this is a bad movement. Like this is still a good movement if, like, if you're yeah. rotating, but it's, yeah. it's something that you want to have control over. You want to decide Definitely. whether or not you want to move in like that or if you want to move out like that and stay there. Yeah, definitely. It's um, and I think it's it's important, like exactly that. Like our, our knee is a hinge joint, right? And um, but it is so so important for the for the joint and the ankles and the Achilles and everything around that to to work into these these muscles and the joints, so that when we do fall, because we're gonna fall, um, the body is used to this, you know, all those stabilizers activating and moving and things like that. And I think at the bottom line, like. That's what having these healthy joints and functioning feet is all about is just, you know, <laughs> letting the body um, be well if we do have a fall or, or player and, um, or a stack or anything like that as well. Yeah, exactly. And you, you just want to – I often think about it like having movement options. So you don't want to be always moving in one single correct way, but you want to have yeah. the option of moving with a lot of, you know, with a lot of stability – or with sort of dynamic stability where you're going in and out of uh, a certain position with control. Mm. And the, the biggest thing is that you have control over what you're doing. Whereas most people try to stand on one leg like that and their legs doing this, even though they're trying to control it, but their knees mm. going out, their hips going in and out. So mm. I think that's the biggest thing is just having that level of control over your body rather than sort of always moving in one correct way. Yeah. Oh, no, definitely. And obviously you guys cover all of this in your workshop, right? So feet, balance, play. Um, you know, there's definitely something you can take away from today, but I so recommend is that I've just purchased myself the second workshop. Um, and yeah, yeah, I guess you guys cover, you know, you, I think it's like three hours of content in the workshop. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, three hours. So the, the workshop ends up running about two hours and then we've got um, like a lot of bonus content as well. I can share some stuff around balance and play as well for people to take home if you've got time. Yeah, yeah let's, let's do it. We've got, I think on this line, we've got another 15 minutes or so. I think they bump us off yeah. after an hour. So oh, yeah, okay. let's do it. All right, let's do yeah. it. So the, the balance system, um, it's always good to just get a little bit of theory with the balance system. So it's made up of three subsystems. So vestibular system, which is in your inner ear. So that sort of calibrates the position of your head in, in relation to where it's at its space, in space. Um, the visual system as well. So you're seeing obviously where your body is at, where your head's at, and also a lot of different things in the environment. And then your proprio, like your somatosensory system, um, part of which is proprioception. And that is basically all the senses in your muscles and joints and skin that tell you where your body is in space. So if I close my eyes and I do this, I can feel that my arm is up in the air because of my somatosensory system, because it's, it's um, sending the feedback to say where that, that joint is. Um, so the cool thing with the balance system is that the more it gets activated, then the more like the brain really prioritizes it. And it actually is very linked to neuroplasticity. So if you're practicing something to do with balance or, or pretty much anything that activates the vestibular system um, and you're making sort of errors while you're learning something, it actually really promotes neuroplasticity. And I think a big reason for that is because if you do have a fall, it can be very disastrous for your health. Like a lot of, a lot of people die from falls. Um, and obviously as, as we get older, it, it becomes more of a risk, but having a fall can be pretty damaging. So our brain oh, really yeah. wants to learn from anything where it's like, oh, I might be at risk of falling here. So um, when you do practice balance in a, in a really challenging way, then you get a, a window of neuroplasticity, which is just extra adaptability of the brain to learn new movements and to learn pretty much anything else as well, which is, is really cool. Um, so a couple of things to play with, with uh, the balance system. So I always like to I'll just change this framing. I have this strip of tape set up in my living room. Um, and that kind of acts like 
because a lot of people see us doing work on beams and stuff and, and the beam is a really great tool and it really challenges your balance. Um, we do sell them, but you can also make your own or, you know, if anyone in your family is handy. Even um, a yoga block is a good place to start for people if they don't have anything to, yeah. to stand on that as well. Yeah. yeah, and I often say that a strip of tape is a really good thing as well because everyone can put a strip of tape down and it just yeah. a, a visual, I guess, representation of, it almost acts like a beam, but it's probably a good place to start for most people because uh, it's not, it's just not as challenging on the feet or the balance, but yeah. it can, we can still make it really challenging. Um, so whatever it is, whether it's a beam or a yoga block or a strip of tape, just starting with single leg balance. I'm going to... Let's see if that works. So just standing on one leg. <clears throat> and again, focusing on that alignment that we just talked about. And then you can start playing with, if this is too easy, you can start playing with some eye movements. So you might look left and then look right. And you'll feel that as you change the position of your eyes, then that will get a little bit harder at the feet to maintain that stability. And then you could look up and down and pretty much anywhere you want. And then you could also start playing with some head movements. So this is challenging now more of the vestibular system. So you're looking all the way up by extending your neck and then looking all the way down, flexing your neck, looking across, looking right, left, and then even maybe doing some neck circles. So you'll really start to feel your feet being very challenged with those head movements. And then another thing that you can play with is um, just closing your eyes because a lot of people really rely on the visual system for balance. And if you can take mm -hmm. that, that whole system away, then it's yeah. just the vestibular and your proprioceptive system doing the work. And yeah. that's, a, that's a really cool way to play with balance. So closing your eyes and <clears throat> just feeling it. It's, I, I like this one because it's a, kind of like a meditation as well, or it feels like even more of a meditation because you're really tuning into your body. You've lost that input from the eyes and you're actually, you can, I find that I can really feel what my body is doing to balance. And obviously it's a lot harder as well. So that's a few ways to challenge <laughs> challenge the balance system um we also like we have a whole beam training system as well but you can then go on to like tandem stance which is one one foot behind the other ninja stance which is like this with your yeah up. and you know we've got fencing stance and all kinds of different things it's probably a bit hard to go through it all um you've got it all on your instagram page though don't you yeah, share I'm a lot sure. of that on your yeah. yeah yeah i've seen a lot of them as well and um yeah, they're super challenging. They <laughs> super are, fun. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, for anyone who wants to know more about that kind of balance training, there's endless ways to to increase the difficulty. Uh, I've got heaps of ways on the story highlights, and it just is the beam story highlights. Um, yeah. And probably one of my last things that I'll leave you with um, is just some hacky sack training. So, <laughs> yeah. This has probably been one of my favorite tools of late. It's super cheap. Like you can get them for like 10 bucks or who knows, uh, we sell them for 10 um, or as part of a kit. But you can also um, just use like a balled up pair of socks. Yeah, I've got like a soft dumpling ball here. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So anything you can find like that, something that's sort of soft and grabbable with your feet, because this is, this is kind of where the play comes in. Like you want to, you don't want to just restrict yourself to just standing on one leg or just doing one thing. You want to sort of vary the challenge. And this last drill that I'll show is a really cool way to get a lot of benefit in one single drill. Pretty much that goes through all of that benefit that we've just talked about in one drill. Yeah. So it's called oh, the hacky clock face. Um, so hacky on the ground. <clears throat> so this is a good one to do after you've done some spreading as well because you're going to have to splay your toes to pick up the hacky sack or the or the balled up pair of socks so picking it up and then you're just placing that foot or placing the hacky sack as far forward as you can in a 12 o'clock direction 
So, and then picking that up and then going out as far as you can to a three o'clock direction. Oh, I love it. And then back out and then back towards a six o'clock direction. And then the hard one, a nine o'clock direction where you're going around like that and then picking it up. And obviously you could also, you could also do 12, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, uh, and so on, um, which is just really challenging. But yeah. uh, I always recommend people start with 12, three, six, nine. And then you get that, you get a challenge on one foot to grab the hacky sack. So that's a dexterity challenge. You get that stability challenge in the foot and the ankle for, and the hip for maintaining that position while you're moving around it in different directions. Um, and then you also get uh, just something to aim for. So it's, the, that drill is called a star excursion drill in, in rehab. Um, yes. But you actually get to do something with a ball. Um, and so it sort of starts to improve your skill and something. And then once you can play with a hacky sack, like we've, we've, again, we've got a whole system of how to learn the hacky sack on our um, other channel called Hacking the System, and that's in the story highlights as well. Um, so people can watch that. But yeah, once you can play with a hacking sack, then it becomes a lot of fun. It's not really as good to do inside, but you get to move your feet around, your feet and hips around in all these different ways. Yeah. And, and it's kind of just like you're focusing on play rather than... Yeah. Like if, I wouldn't do that unless I was playing with a hacky sack. So it's it's a it's a pretty cool tool, um, and yeah, very simple but very profound. Mm, like two big things I picked up on there was such big hip mobility. I said a lot of us at the moment, especially in lockdown, are sitting yeah. more, um, and you know that's just train or oh, it's our, our brain like telling our hip, oh, like we're functioning like a hinge joint. It's not. It's yeah. a ball and socket joint meant to move around yeah. the joint. So I love that play aspect to that where you're doing something but don't really feel like you're doing something yeah um, exactly. and i think that's it at the end of the day if we don't enjoy what we do movement wise then it's not going to be fun we're not going to get anything out of it and that's why i love movement so much because it is play and yeah. you start to you're doing something with your body that feels good and you're having fun at the same time and i think that's a game changer yeah 100 percent. yeah that if I could leave any, anyone with a, a big takeaway is that find, find something that you enjoy. Do, you know, it, I think work has its place where you're rehabbing the body or prehabbing and making sure that it's strong and mobile, but then really put your body to the test by playing something that is new uh, or something that you really love doing because that's really the only way that you're going to have a sustainable movement practice in the long term. Yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, look, that was amazing. I think we've got like two minutes left or so. I'm so grateful. There's some really amazing stuff shared there. Um, I can't wait to get a hacky sack, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully my dog doesn't take off with it. Uh -huh. um, but, <laughs> but it really, really is, I think, that aspect of look after your feet, practice balancing, because if we don't practice, we're going to suck at it. Um, and so many people I know are just like, I'm really terrible at balance great, use that as a teacher to then do it more. The things we are shit at are the things we need to practice. Um, and then, yeah, go and play. Get get a hacky, get a balance beam. Like, go, as I said, go check them out. They sell balance beams on there, and I can't recommend them enough. As I said, my, <laughs> my dad made my one. Um, <laughs> but honestly, the ones they sell there, they are the best tool that you can get. I so, so agree. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I really like the... The tools like a beam and a hacky sack that just allow you to express your body like they're they are tools but um they sort of allow you to express the capacity of your body in a fun way um and yeah like like i've always said like we, you don't have to get the ones from us like building your own is a really fun project and and some people make their own hacky sacks like if you know how to to knit and, yeah. sew and, and everything then you can make your own or you know yeah. there's just a lot of different options but um i guess we just like to provide a very solid good option for people like we've, we've got really well sourced materials and everything so if people just want you know okay i just want to get it then great we sell them but yeah don't feel like you have to get it from us you can i think i think doing a diy uh sort of 
job is is a really cool project as well if you've got the time and the materials definitely yeah. uh, and just lastly before i finish too if anybody is interested in i guess barefoot shoes if you are looking into that as well i know there's a link on your site for vivo mm -hmm. uh, barefoot as well um but yeah definitely i haven't worn regular sneakers in a long time um yeah. and you know most of the time i go bare feet um but it's just a, a nice way to give your feet a bit of space and to come back to a more natural and functioning foot as well 100 percent. yeah that's the most important thing um but yeah that we do sell vivo barefoot on our website um mm. but yeah there's some other good brands like liguano i really like um zero has some more like affordable yeah. ones i suppose um yeah. there's paper crane i think are really good for kids shoes a very nice oh. affordable kids cool. shoes um yeah and you know earth runners for sandals and so there's a heap of different brands out there so <laughs> just i think the biggest thing for people is just finding a a a, a brand and a style that that suits their own sense of style and suits their budget because yeah, you, you want to you want it to be something that you you'll really wear a lot and you want it to be something that you're not yeah. like i guess hating yourself for buying <laughs> um definitely yeah, yeah. Oh, um, so true, so true. Um, well, I think that that's it. We've got like one minute. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I hope all of you guys have jumped on. Thank you. There's quite a few jumping on, as yeah, I've seen. I'm um, so grateful. I hope you guys have all got something from that. Um, go jump on. Um, as I said, check out the workshop that these guys are doing. It's, it's online. Um, such amazing content. I've got so much from it myself. Um, I'll provide the details and the links. And, yeah, thank you, James. That was incredible. My pleasure. That was fun. Anytime. Yeah, totally. It goes so quickly, doesn't it? Yeah. It's just like, whoa, it's like an hour gone already. <laughs> but um, no, nah, super, super grateful, and I really, really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone who jumped on today. Yeah, thanks for watching, guys. Sweet. Easy. See ya. Thanks, James. Thanks.